What kind of creature has the body of a rhino, the stature of an elephant, six bony horns on its skull and saber-like tusks erupting from its jaws? That description might sound like something from mythology, but it's a real animal that once roamed Earth. It's called Uintotherium. This massive herbivore lived during the Eocene Epoch around 45 million years ago. It reached about 13 feet in length, stood up to 5.6 feet at the shoulder, and could weigh nearly 2.2 tons. Scientifically, it belongs to the order Dinocerata genus Wintertherium, with fossils of multiple species found in North America and China. What strikes researchers most about Uintertherium is not just its size, but the unusual architecture of its head. Fossils reveal skulls stretching up to 30 inches about the length of a small bathtub, massive slabs of bone dominated by hollows and ridges. The cranial walls were exceptionally thick and riddled with large sinus cavities, leaving far less room for brain tissue than you might expect in an animal of nearly 2.2 tons. Instead of a spacious cranial vault, there was a proportionally tiny cavity estimated to have housed a brain no larger than that of a domestic cat. Compared to modern giants like elephants, which balance their massive heads with equally massive brains, Uintotherium's arrangement looks mismatched, raising questions about what evolutionary pressures produce such a head. That contrast is easier to see when you think of elephants. They also carry bulky skulls, but those are filled with brains weighing several pounds packed with folds that manage communication memory and social complexity. Uintotherium's brain, by comparison, was a fraction of that size. Much of its cranium was instead occupied by bone and sinus chambers, not neural tissue. This combination suggests the animal may not have relied on high intelligence so much as its imposing physical presence. But here lies the paradox. If the brain was minimized and the head so unwieldy, what made this skull advantageous enough to persist? The first clue lies in the bony growths sprouting across the skull. Uintotherium didn't wear a single horn like a rhinoceros or a pair like a bovid. It carried three distinct pairs of protrusions known as ossicones. These structures ranged from about to two to 10 inches in life and were likely covered in skin and hair, not sharp keratin sheaths. Two smaller pairs sat nearer the front, a robust central pair rose along the midline of the skull and another set projected above the cheeks. Instead of sharp spear-like points, they resembled blunt, rounded knobs. To a predator, these were hardly threatening weapons. To another, Uintotherium, however, they might have conveyed status or maturity. The arrangement, while visually chaotic, meant the skull projected an unmistakable silhouette. This brings us to one of the leading hypotheses, display. In many modern species, structures that seem impractical often evolve as signals within the species itself. Deer antlers, for example, require enormous resources to grow and are used less for predator defense than for impressing rivals. Wintertherium's knobs may have filled a similar role. They could have served as visual cues during contests between males or markers of dominance in social groups. Importantly, there is little direct evidence of combat wear on these protuberances. Paleontologists generally lean toward the horns being ornaments or display structures, though defensive or ritualized combat uses cannot be completely ruled out. Another point of curiosity lies within the skull's hollow structure. The massive sinuses likely help lighten its 30 inch length, but researchers have also wondered whether they might have influenced sound. In theory, chambers of that size could alter calls, perhaps deepening or amplifying them in ways similar to how resonant cavities in elephant skulls contribute to their infrasonic rumbles. That being said, direct fossil evidence for vocal resonance in Uintartherium is lacking. It remains only a hypothesis plausible, but not confirmed. Of course, the skull was not just horned, it housed a set of teeth that added yet another layer to the puzzle. And it's here when we shift our attention to those saber-like upper canines that the story of Wintertherium becomes even stranger. Standing before Wintertherium, one feature would have commanded your attention, the intimidating set of upper canines, long and blade-like in males, much smaller in females. These tusks look out of place on a plant eating mammal, especially one with broad molars designed for soft leaves and aquatic plants. The mismatch between diet and weapon-like teeth raises the central puzzle. What purpose did they really serve? The chewing teeth themselves are straightforward. Uintertherium's molars were broad ridged surfaces effective for crushing tender marshy vegetation rather than grinding tough grasses. That much explains its basic diet. 
but towering over these crowned teeth were the canines. In males, they extended dramatically downward, giving the skull an almost saber-tooth profile. Because females had much smaller versions, it is reasonable to assume the canines were not strictly required for feeding. Sexual dimorphism usually points toward a display or competition function where exaggerated traits in males act as signals or tools during rival encounters. Modern analogues support this interpretation. Living tusked herbivores like musk deer or Chinese water deer show almost identical patterns. Males grow long downward pointing canines, which they use not for predation, but for display and intraspecific fighting. These tusks flash in visual threats and in close contests, they can inflict limited wounds. By comparison, Uintotherium's canines were uh, larger and heavier, but the principle may have been the same. They likely served as visual statements of size and strength, putting the primary explanation firmly within the realm of sexual selection. At the same time, there is no need to assume the tusks were strictly ornamental. Researchers note that their curvature could have provided practical help in feeding. Wading in wetlands, Uintotherium may have lowered its head to snag aquatic vegetation. With the tusks hooked around soft reeds or shoots, it could pull the plants loose before mashing them between its molars. This vegetation hook hypothesis aligns with dental wear patterns and the animal's known browsing tendencies. Taken together, the dual picture makes sense. The canines were highly visible display organs, most important in mating and male-male competition, but they also may have served a secondary role in aiding the animal's feeding in swampy habitats. This combination of dramatic display backed by occasional utility has parallels in many modern animals. Walrus tusks, for instance, can haul bodies onto ice, but they also broadcast physical condition to rivals. Musk deer tusks can wound, but they are mostly about signaling dominance. Uintotherium likely fit into the same category, not a predator armed with sabers, but a herbivore adapting exaggerated features to interact with its own species and its environment. The clearest interpretation is that the tusks were first and foremost tools of display. Their sexual dimorphism rules out a universal survival need since both sexes would otherwise share them equally. Their sheer size reinforced male dominance in contests while their curvature could still provide modest assistance in pulling plants or in warding off threats. When summed up, the simplest conclusion is that Wintertherium's dentition reflects a primary function of display and competition with possible supporting roles in feeding and defense. Picture a group of these animals in a wet clearing, females feeding quietly while males angle their heads, their tusks, catching the light as signals as much as physical hardware. Any confrontation may have been more about intimidation and ritual posturing than about lethal violence. The momentary flashes of tusks would have marked strength while the herd continued to browse on vegetation that matched their grinding molars. Uintotherium lived in warm, humid Eocene environments, such as swamps, river margins, and floodplain forests, where soft, leafy plants and aquatic vegetation were abundant. Fossils from places like the Bridger Basin in Wyoming and the Lushi Basin in China reveal the kinds of landscapes these mega herbivores favored, tangled wetlands, dense forests, and wide stretches of water that supported rich plant growth. In this setting, a massive slow-moving browser could thrive without relying on speed or agility. The body of Uintotherium was built less for running than for stability. Its limbs were robust and column-like with hooves at the tips that spread its weight across muddy or uneven ground. This structure made it possible to walk steadily through swampy terrain where a lighter limbed animal might sink. Even its sternum tells part of the story formed of horizontal segments rather than the vertical pattern seen in modern rhinos, an unusual adaptation that helped brace a chest supporting immense weight. With this build, the animal could wade confidently each footfall designed for balance rather than burst speed. Dietary evidence confirms why these habitats suited it so well. Where on Uintotherium's molars shows flattening patterns from chewing soft, moist vegetation, not the abrasion that comes from grasses. At this point in Earth's history, grasslands had not yet spread widely, so its food came from tender leaves, aquatic plants, and swamp foliage. Males may have pulled reeds or plants loose with their long upper canines, while both sexes crushed bulk meals against their broad molars. Between forests, floodplains, and rivers food was plentiful enough to support multiple individuals in the same territory. 
herd life was feasible because the environment kept up with their heavy demands. Large size, it offered another layer of protection. Adult Uintotherium could stretch about 13 feet in length and weigh nearly two and a half tons. This bulk alone discouraged most predators. Carnivores of the time, creodonts and nimravids among them did exist in the same habitats. But research suggests adult Uintotherium likely faced few predators due to its size and mass. Chasing and tackling such a giant in swampy terrain was risky. Young calves may have been more vulnerable, but the collective strength of surrounding adults created a deterrent. A modern comparison makes the point clear. Much like hippos in Africa today, Uintotherium relied on its presence as much as any weapon. Hippos are not especially swift or armed with elaborate horns, but their bulk combined with a defensive attitude drives most predators away. Uintotherium, while browsing instead of grazing, occupied a similar role. Its presence alone could transform a swamp clearing into a zone where predators knew better than to test the odds. Life for Uintotherium then was shaped by this triad of environment, food and mass. Its hooved weight bearing legs anchored it in wetlands. Its specialized molars fit a diet of soft aquatic plants and forest leaves, and its massive frame discouraged predators in a way few adaptations could match. Horns and tusks may have mattered most in social interactions, but the greater safety net came from the environments themselves, landscapes that gave the animal abundant food and relative security. Several museums today preserve that vision of Wintertherium's world. Casts and skeleton reconstructions stand at the Utah Field House and the Smithsonian's National Museum of Natural History, where visitors can see just how large and imposing it was. These displays give a sense of the weight this animal carried through its swamp forests and the presence it must have had across the Eocene landscape. Its fossils, however, are not confined to a single corner of the globe. Remains appear thousands of miles apart, hinting that this swamp-dwelling herbivore was more widespread than its heavy build might suggest. That geographic reach opens another chapter in its story, one that brings us to the problem of how such a creature managed to exist on two different continents. At the height of its success, Uintotherium was not just a local swamp dweller, but a genus that managed to leave fossils on both sides of the Pacific. Remains from the Bridger and Washaki formations in Wyoming and Utah and the Lushi formation in Henan, China, confirm that this animal spread across continents. Two recognized species captured these ranges, Uintotherium anseps in North America during the early to middle Eocene, about 56 to 38 million years ago, and Uintotherium inspiratus in China during the middle to to late Eocene, roughly 48 to 34 million years ago. This shared distribution tells us that what might seem like an immobile marsh tide giant was in fact part of a faunal network stretching across the Northern Hemisphere. The simplest explanation lies in paleogeography. During the Eocene, North America and Asia were linked by the Beringia Land Bridge. Far from today's frozen tundra, it was a mild zone of forests, wetlands, and broad rivers that provided continuous browse for animals to follow. Other herbivores, carnivores, and small mammals also made use of this passage, and Uintotherium likely moved in family groups at a slow but steady pace. The connection didn't require them to outrun competitors or swim open oceans. It was a long, vegetated corridor that over generations enabled their gradual dispersal between continents. The fossil evidence suggests that these migrations were more than one-off events. Subtle differences in skull shape and dentition between U. anseps and U. inspiratus point to regional adaptations and possible diet shifts with Chinese forms, perhaps adjusting to locally available vegetation under different rainfall patterns. What emerges from this record is a portrait of flexibility. For all its ungainly design, the genus survived across millions of years in multiple habitats, adapting enough to persist as environments shifted gradually. Still, Uintotherium's dominance was not permanent. Its Eocene world was crowded with other large browsers. Brontotheres, for example, were perisodactyl relatives that reached even larger sizes, sporting paired Y-shaped horns on their skulls. Primitive rhinoceratoids also entered the scene more lightly built, more mobile and capable of grazing or browsing across increasingly open habitats as rainfall patterns grew seasonal. This diversification meant that what once was an abundant, reliable resource base, lush swamp plants and soft forest leaves began to fragment. Competitors could withstand tougher vegetation or range into new areas, while Wintertherium remained adapted to permanent wetlands and river margins. 
Paleontologists generally interpret its decline as the result of two overlapping pressures. First competition, newer browsers filled its niche more efficiently pressing in on food sources that Uintotherium required in bulk. Second climate shift, the middle to late Eocene, trended toward cooler and drier conditions with forests breaking into patchier landscapes. For a specialist anchored to swampy grounds, neither development was favorable. Features that once gave it presence, thick horns, saber-like tusks, were irrelevant against shrinking food supplies and rivals better suited to drier terrain. By the late Eocene, around 37 to 38 million years ago, Uintotherium disappears from the fossil record. Its extinction did not happen in isolation, but as part of a broader turnover. Brontotheres would themselves rise and vanish, replaced by evolving rhinoceroses and other herbivores. Each shift reflected the same underlying pattern animals whose adaptations match the environment persisted while those tied too tightly to one set of conditions were left behind. Uintotherium's end is thus tied less to any single adversary or event and more to this interplay of climate change and competition, both steadily closing in over millions of years. What remains striking is that Wintertherium, for all its strength and size, was undone not on battlefields of predator against prey, but in quieter struggles of diet range and reproduction. That lesson resonates beyond its skeleton, even the most spectacular anatomical specializations, horns like domes, tusks like sabers, cannot secure survival when the environment around them shifts. The balance between anatomy and ecology is delicate and once disrupted, even giants fall. With this in mind, its story creates a bridge to a broader reflection. When you look at tangles of horns or the flash of tusks in its reconstructions, you see not just weaponry, but signals, tools of interaction and symbols of presence. Those meanings and not force alone help explain why Uintotherium thrived as long as it did and why its legacy still carries lessons about adaptation limitation and the true nature of survival. In the end, Uintotherium stands as a reminder that sometimes the most dramatic traits in the fossil record were not built for battle. The balance of evidence suggests its six blunt horns and sabre-like tusks were mainly social signals shaped by communication and sexual selection, though they may have carried secondary roles in feeding or deterrence. Uintotherium shows us that evolution often favours spectacle and social signalling, as I mentioned signalling, and that those same specialisations can be risky when the world changes. If you liked this deep dive into a prehistoric oddity, subscribe and tell us in the comments which feature horns or tusks would you put money on being purely decorative?